Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, Lord, I am so thankful for your presence here with us. I thank you for the work that you are doing in hearts. Lord God, I know that there are, there are places that are hard for some people this morning. And I, I just, Lord, I bring those things before you. I bring before you, Lord, the griefs and the, the heartaches. And I thank you, Lord, that you hear our prayers. I thank you, Lord, that you are the high tower, the place of shelter, the place that we can run. You are the almighty God that loves us, and we are thankful. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, we're doing March birthday greetings this morning. And I don't have a list of all those who have birthdays in March. So if you have birthdays in March, raise your hand. Raise your hand. Birthdays in March. Dylan and Travis. We are going to... Jenna. Jenna. Okay. Anybody else? Grace. Grace. <laughs> so we sing. Birthday greetings today. May God bless and we pray. Live for Jesus, live for Jesus. May he guide you always. Amen. Amen. I'm going to light this. have the privilege this morning I'm going to get a which one of these works you want to have yep. all right okay we have the privilege this morning of accepting George and Diana into membership and I am thrilled about this um I asked them not to come up right away because I know that George just had surgery on his knee and he wasn't sure he could stand that long. So we are going to do it with them in the front pew and then I'll have them stand up and turn around and we'll pray for them. Let them go first, you think? Let's just wait and we'll do it after. So they're talking about the kids, whether it's, we should send them down first. Um, George and Diana O'Neill have been active Christians now for several years. They have expressed their desire to join us at Baroque in our vision to worship God, nurture one another, and reach the world for Jesus Christ. We've been blessed by their attendance here and thankful for their desire to join this body and membership. I am thankful and excited for it. I got some questions for you. George and Diana, have you accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and been baptized before others as witness and testimony to your desire to obey him as your Lord? Say, I have. Have you read our statement of faith and beliefs and agree with these? Do you accept the word of God as guide and authority for your life? Are you willing to give and receive counsel in this congregation? Are you ready to participate in the mission of Baroque Community Church to worship God, minister to each other, and reach the world for Jesus Christ? In our hymnals, worship book 794 in the back, if you guys would look it up for me. You don't have to. There's a reception of new members reading. Seven ninety four. George and Diana have presented to us have witnessed to their faith in Jesus Christ and offer themselves as companions in our obedience to Christ. It is our privilege and joy to welcome them into our family of faith. We receive you even as Christ has received us. We open ourselves to fellowship with you in worship, study, service, and discipline. We pledge our willingness to give and receive counsel to offer and accept forgiveness in the redeemed community. 
We joyfully accept you as partners both in the care of our spiritual family in our mission to the world. Would you stand up and turn around and face the congregation? Would you guys just reach your hands out to them, please? I will pray, and while I'm doing so, if you have any words or prayers, would you please, ask, when I'm done, go ahead and, and give them. Lord, we thank you for these precious saints that you have brought to us. We are thankful for their friendship, their fellowship, their love. We are also thankful for the gifts you bring us through them. We welcome them as you have welcomed them. We ask your blessing on them. We ask that your Holy Spirit continue the work you've begun in their lives and you would lead them step by step. We lift them up before you and call on you to work mightily in and through their lives, bringing healing and love to them and others. We ask you to protect the relationship between us and them in Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Amen. Any words or prayers from the people? All right, you may sit down. This is the time that we usually come forward and we, we shake their hands and give them hugs and tell them how glad we are they're a part of the body of Christ. But due to COVID, we're not going to do that. <laughs> so I'm going to ask <laughs> that we just offer a clap offering of thankfulness for this. stand if you want to stand if you want to remain seated that's fine just just enter into worship this morning however the lord leads you and however you're comfortable
been speaking to George and Diane that, that, that the Lord did lead you here and, and your days of wondering and your days of wandering are over and that he's brought you to where you're supposed to be. The Lord's bringing healing and restoration in this season. Choose healing and restoration. Or if you will turn in your hymns for the family to 108, if we will sing the hymn of the church, Rock of Ages. Number 108. Thank you, Lord. We are going to be reading from Isaiah 58, 6 through 12. Is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen? To loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke. To set the oppressed free and break every yoke. Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? Will you see the naked to clothe them? and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood. Then your light will break forth like the dawn, and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help, and he will say, Here am I. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing finger and malicious talk, and if you spend yourselves in behalf of the hungry, and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness, and your noon will become like the and your and their night will become like the noonday. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun scorched land and will strengthen your frame. 
you will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. May God bless the reading of his word. Amen. We are going to pray for our messengers this morning. Uh, Kim and Josh are down at Junior Church. Marissa and Angel are with Toddler Nursery. And Emmett will be bringing our word here. So let's pray for them. Lord, I ask that you would bless and help as these messengers speak the word that you've put in their heart. I ask that you would help the kids, Lord, that are downstairs and in toddler nursery to be receptive and be able to understand your love and your goodness to them. I ask, Lord, that we would also hear your word to us this morning. Lord, that our hearts would be opened and we would be receptive to what you have to speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. I'm nice and loud. I hope everyone can hear me. I get complaints about that. Oh, start, I'm tired, and I assume the rest of you all are too, but I'm glad you're here this morning. Some of you aren't tired, apparently, but I'm still glad you're here this morning. And for those online, I'm glad that you're listening, whether now or later. Um, this isn't part of my sermon. I just wanted to say that I, I'm really glad to be here. I like being at church. I do. Um, I work mostly with the kids. I know they actually like being here at church, too, because they ask me about it, and they get sad whenever we have to cancel for weather or, or the health outbreak that we had last year. So it's, uh, it's good to be in the house of the Lord. It's good to be with fellowship. And uh, I, I, for one, am glad I'm here. I hope the rest of you are also glad that you're here, but that's between you and God. Uh, so we'll, we'll open with prayer. Uh, Father God, thank you that we're either able to gather here this morning. There are many around our world that aren't able to. I thank you that we can do so in peace. I pray, Lord, that you would be with us, each and every one individually, as only you can be, that you would open our hearts to hear the message today, that uh, your words would spring forth, not what I have to say, as you are what matter, and I am not. I thank you, Lord, for your presence here today. Amen. So I was tasked with preaching on our the spiritual guidance of the Holy Spirit. Uh, it's actually in John. And uh, just a little background uh, for the text, for the, the portion that we're at. This is on, the, on the, the final night, Jesus has been around on this earth for 33-ish years. And he's been doing ministry for three-ish years at this point, thereabouts, from what we can gather. Um, and he's, he's meeting with this, the disciples. This is the, the Last Supper time. This is the end of his time with ministry on earth right before he goes to the cross. And he knows this. And the disciples should know this but do not. And so he's speaking to them. And he says, I'm leaving. I'm, I'm going away. Um, but don't worry because I'm sending someone to come and help you. And the disciples don't understand what he means when he says that he's leaving. They also have no concept for what he means when he says that he's sending someone to help them, right? Their, their minds are not on the things of God at the moment. They haven't yet, haven't yet realized what we all as Christians know. The Garden of Gethsemane happens. He's betrayed. He's judged. He's taken to the cross. He's crucified. He's resurrected. He comes back. He sees them. They rejoice. They, they think he's a ghost for a little bit, but then he eats fish, and that obviously means he's not a ghost. That's in Luke, by the way. It's one of my favorite parts. Um... And then uh, he ascends, right? And he's gone again. He actually, he did what he said he was going to do. He left, okay? And the disciples and the, the early church, they're left with the promise that he's going to send a helper. And so they do what they were supposed to do, and they go to Jerusalem, and they patiently wait for the helper. And again, they have no concept of who Jesus is sending. They have no concept of the helper that they're waiting for. They have no idea what it is that they're expecting, but they know that Jesus said he was sending someone to help, and they know that Jesus said that they're supposed to wait for the helper before they start their ministry, and so they do what they're told, and they wait, and they wait, and, the, and then finally the day of Pentecost comes, and the helper appears, 
And the Holy Spirit is the one that comes with a great wind and with fire, and the early church begins there on that day, all right? But again, I, I don't think that they had any real concept at the time that what they were waiting for is what they got, okay? So that was where, where for our scripture, for the, the message portion, the, the, uh, the discipline of guidance, we're supposed to be talking about the guidance that we get from the Holy Spirit. I want to start a little bit with, with a, a, a backtrack for what, what guidance, what revelation from God uh, really is. And that's, that's really what we're talking about here. When we talk about guidance from the Holy Spirit, what we're talking about is divine revelation. Okay? And divine revelation, this is, uh, I, I, wanna, I, I really want to talk about this because I, I enjoy doing this kind of teaching stuff. Uh, divine revelation comes in multiple facets. And uh, the most common ones that we have would be scripture reading, which is very good, and I recommend it. Prayer, which is very good, and I recommend it. Worship, also very good, still recommend it. Um, some of the lesser one ones, uh, prophecy, dreams, and visions, which are very common in the Old and New Testament, less common usually in the uh, American church today, but they're still very good. And I do. I recommend all of these. These are all scripturally based. They're all in scripture. They're all used. Therefore, they are very good, and therefore, I recommend them. So... But they're less common nowadays than they were listed in the Old Testament and New Testament in depending on where you're at, culturally speaking. And the American church in general is less talked about, but there's still some denominations and some churches that do function really well in those particular spiritual giftings. Um, this kind of leads to the next point, that divine revelation comes in various facets, and it's kind of the motto of different strokes for different folks is kind of the way it goes. If you are seeking knowledge from God, he will find a way to communicate it to you. Whatever facet it is that is best way for God to communicate to you the knowledge that you need from God, he will find a way to do so because he is God and you are seeking after him. I've never had a time in my life where I've sought things from God and he has not delivered to me that which I need. It has not always been in the way that I wanted him to deliver to me that which I needed, but it has always arrived regardless. God is faithful to his servants and he always makes sure that, that we get what we need. Just like the disciples there in the upper room in Acts, I doubt we're expecting the tongues of fire and to speak in uh, other languages and then for Peter to get up and convince people that he was not drunk and then have 3,000 people be saved. Oftentimes, God defies our expectations but still meets our needs. Um, and, and the way that that's done is through, oftentimes, at least to start with, for what I'm talking about today would be divine revelation. Uh, there's a couple of types that are, that are noted. There's Two that I want to, uh, several groupings, all right, that are kind of compare and contrast for what it is. General and specific revelation. General revelation, a really good example of that would be the Bible, is scripture. This is stuff that's true for all time, no matter what, in every circumstance. can be applied broadly across the board, which means it's rather general because it's always true. All right, and then there's specific revelation, which is revelation that's specific to an individual group for a specific time. Okay, so, for example, Jesus says, Love one another as I have first loved you, okay? There's general revelation. It's available to everybody. It's always true for all time. But it's not specific in that it's like, I need you to go buy that person a house and then provide for them for a year and love as Christ is first. You know, that would be a specific revelation to a person or to a group, okay? Um, a a, a follow-up split would then be, you know, corporate and singular revelation sometimes. God gives revelation to a group of people. You see this a lot of times in the Old Testament where prophets say, Israel, you're doing bad things. All of you, corporately, as a group, you need to repent. You need to turn towards God. God's judgment will be upon you as a group because you are, you are acting together as a group, as a corporate body. There's also singular or individual revelation, which is something that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 where he contrasts the prophecy, which is given to the whole congregation and body, and the speaking in tongues, which is an individual portion that's just for you personally. Sometimes the things that God reveals to you personally don't really need to be shared to everybody. Sometimes they can be. Um, and the last one that kind of breaks into the divine revelation is there's divine revelation about God and God's character. And there's divine revelation that because of God's character, you are required to then do the thing. So um, a lot of what we have for Scripture, uh, it's, a lot of these, they can be both. There's some very specific revelation that was specific revelation at the time. For example, the prophecies in the Old Testament, the things that the prophets were speaking to Israel, was specific to them in that moment. But it's scripture, so it's also general revelation that's available to all of us that reveals God's character. 
Because we, as people, we cannot understand and fathom and reason God. All right, God is infinite and beyond us. Um, which honestly, and I, I, is why I worship Him. Is something I try to drive home to the the kids downstairs. That one of the things, th- one of the reasons that God is worthy of our worship and our our undying devotion is that He is beyond us. Is that He is greater than we are. I I see no purpose in worshiping a being that is only as good as I am, or as intelligent as I am. I mean, if if they are, if I can fully understand this particular being, that means that it's entirely possible I could do a better job. What's the point of of submitting myself to such a being? So, it's true. God is beyond me in ways that I can't. I can't actually fathom the ways that God is beyond my person. That is how big and mighty and awesome that God is. And that is why divine revelation has to start with God because it cannot start with us. We, we can't do it. We can't understand it. That's one of the reasons why Christ came in the first place was because he was like, you don't know who my father is because you can't. I mean, you have tried. It was a good effort. It was solid, but you failed horribly. All right? That would be like all of Genesis up to Noah. Okay? And so God came and revealed himself to us and said, this, this, this is who I am. All right, this is the example for who you should be. This is what I want for you. And we can then read that uh, in our scripture, the holy word of God, and say, ah, now I understand. Okay? Because God has then shown it to us. Right? So, uh, the, and, and the purpose of that revelation is, is to, generally, is to elicit a change within our being. Uh, we're all, I, I think, fairly well aware that we all are terrible people and we all sin. And we, without, without God's grace, without God's power, without God's movement, we would do horrible, terrible things and be proud of the horrible, terrible things that we do. It's just, it's just human nature, right? And so what God is doing with his divine revelation is that he is saying to us that that needs to change. And, and, and Paul and James, they talk about how that the law is like a mirror reflected darkly so that we can see that, you know, hey, by the way, this is wrong which sometimes you read in the Bible and you're like, yes, that's obviously wrong, especially in the Old Testament. We're like, yes, that's clearly not a good thing. I think specifically of judges. There's a lot of judges where you're like, why did you think that was a good idea? Because at the time, it was not bad. It was not moral. The, the standards of society and civilization in the ancient world were very different than what we live in today. And civilization, you know, several thousand years from now, I assume will also be very different in what is considered morally moral and acceptable. God indicates to us, you know, one standard that we're supposed to live by. And he's communicated that with us throughout the generations. And we, thankfully, have thousands of years of church history of Christians striving to be what it is that God has called us to and working towards being the fulfillment of what it means to be Christian. And, and I'm very thankful for that. And that it's not something to be, to be forgotten or to be left behind. Um, and that, that all comes from divine revelation. That is all Holy Spirit driven. It all starts with God. And, and the purpose, again, is to elicit an internal change. At least the start. It's, it's, it's a twofold purpose. But it starts with eliciting that, that internal change. Um, Sorry, I'm, I'm making sure I'm in the right spot here. Yeah, so the uh, the Holy Spirit starts that, that internal process. And if you look in Scripture for the description of what the Holy Spirit does with us, most of the, 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 the things have an internal start. There's an in is uh, all of them actually really that I, c- I can think of that I found. But I say most because I don't like to be... I like to leave room to be wrong because I know I am a lot of time. So, you know. Anyway, it starts with an internal focus and change. The fruit of the Holy Spirit all right, is peace, love, joy, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control, which is over there, but I think I got it right. Did I miss one? Faithfulness, right? So this it starts with an internal, it's an internal start. Prophecy is an internal start, right? The, the works of healing starts when he talks about in Scripture that they, they, felt a leading from God that this was something they were supposed to do, and so they then did the thing, all right? But coupled with our internal action, 
is an external response, okay? Now, the purpose of, a, of that divine revelation is to change something that's within you as a person and a being, to make you more like what it is that God wants you to be. But if there is no external response, if there is no sign, if there is no actual fruit that you bear, then there is no internal change, okay? There, that you can't say, you know, oh, I, I have the peace of God, where if people look at your life, they say, no, you don't. You're not living a life that's full of peace that I can see. Therefore, your inside is not actually full of peace because that peace is not being reflected. You say, I think I have self-control, but people look at you and say, you have absolutely no self-control. You're zero self-control at all. You are the least self-controlled person I see. You don't have self-control because that self-control, at least not on the inside, because it's not something that's made manifest in existence. Okay? Uh, James writes that faith without works is dead. You can't claim to have faith but live a life that, that appears to be without faith, that appears to be without works. Christ's internal change should drive us to do things, to be about his work, right? Even, even he went, Jesus contrasted in Matthew, he said that the ones that are his friends, the ones welcomed in the kingdom of heaven are the ones that actually do the work, that feed the hungry, clothe the naked, that give drinks to those that are thirsty, right, that visit people in prison. The one that did the work, those are the ones that are his friends. Their actions reflected an internal state of being that is consistent with who Christ calls us to be. We cannot claim to walk as, as having some sort of divine revelation if our lives don't also reflect that. And also counter to that particular portion, the first part, the internal change, is important. You can't just skip to external uh, uh, actions, right, that are supposed to reflect internal change. Jesus spends all of the Gospels railing against the Pharisees for doing that exact same thing. The Pharisees did a lot of actions that were required under the Old Testament. They did their sacrifices, all right? They did their tithes. They were out there. They knew the word. They were out preaching. They were out running the, the synagogues, all right? They were doing the work. And Jesus looks at them and said, you are happily skipping your way to hell. You are doing wrong, okay? This is not what I am about. I see what is inside of you. It is full of death, Okay? So y the, the internal action is just as important as the external action. It cannot be one or the other, which, again, is something that God revealed over time because left to our own devices, we did, the, the people ended up doing one or the other. That's, that's the Old Testament, right? They tried really hard. They never got the internal change right. But they, they, they also, therefore, never got the external effects right. So we get to the New Testament. We had this group of people that were trying really, really hard to make sure they did all of the things right in an external fashion. And Jesus says, you are still doing it wrong because you're trying to do it on your own. You have missed allowing God to make forth that effort and to do what is necessary in your life to have that external action that has meaning and has matter. Right? Which is the point. External actions without internal effects are meaningless. They're pointless. They have no, no nothing. That's why Paul writes that without love, I am nothing. You know, without that actual internal effects of God, what I do is pointless, is meaningless. Right? So now you're like, well, great. So I'm just hosed no matter what? Well, no, thankfully, because we have that divine revelation. And as Jesus said when he left the disciples, before you get started, I'm sending to you a helper, okay, a counselor, you know, someone to walk with you and judge the contents of your heart and judge the actions that you commit and help you to understand what it is that I expect of you. Because left to your own devices, you're going to end up in the same position that humanity has ended up for the last 2,000 years of recorded scripture and history of trying to live up to God's standards and failing miserably time and time again, right? And so that is what we have as Christians today. We have access, thankfully, to a helper and access to a, a standard in which we can ensure that our lives are living, uh, are, are living up to the potential that Christ has called us to, right? And so to do that, to make sure and we are walking in a correct standard with God, we have to practice the discipline of listening. Now, I, I work a lot with children. I know most people here either are parents or grandparents or are familiar with children. Everyone that's ever worked with children or had children or been around children at all will tell you that children do not like to listen. They do not like it at all. 
You tell them to do the thing, sometimes they willfully decide they are going to do that thing anyway because it is what they want to do in the moment. Sometimes they will, pray, they will pretend as if they cannot hear you and do not understand the word no, which is absolutely silly because you know and they know that they understand what's happening. Right? They want nothing to be involved. Right? Listening is an action, especially when you're talking about listening to an authority figure with kids, is an action of giving up their free will to listen to somebody else. And humans as a species, we really don't like that. Right? There are lots of adults that don't like that. I personally don't particularly like that, especially if you're not somebody that I respect or trust. You know, But, but the act of giving up our free will is something that's necessary and, and scripturally a part of what it means to be Christian. All right? Our free will, left to our own devices, leads us into mess all the time. And then we are surprised when we get there every time. It's without fail. That's, that's basically all of Scripture is I did a bad thing, and now bad things are happening. Why am I here? This makes absolutely no sense. Clearly, I am better than this. All right? So we have to practice on a daily and a personal level that art of listening. All right? And that art of listening, as I said at the beginning, if you are looking for a revelation from God, he will find a way to communicate to you what that truth is. He will find a way to talk to you. If you are willing to seek out God and say, God, I understand that I'm a sinner. I understand that I've made mistakes. I understand that left to my own devices, I make poor choices. I would like for you to ensure, and I walk the path that you have, because I trust that your will for my life is better than my will for my life. And, and scripture tells us, and history tells us, and I can personally tell you from just as a, uh, a, a testimony that, that God's will for your life is better than your will for your life. And he will bless you in ways that you can't understand. And while you may believe that you have a better plan for your life, you don't. Because God knows you actually better than you do, which is weird. I, I understand that. And it is something that take, took me a while to really believe, but it's true. I, I, it really is true. God knows you better than you do, and when he calls you to do something, even if it's difficult or hard or silly, all right, trust that as a good father and a good shepherd that he's looking out for your best interest. And he will He will bless you, and he will walk with you. And that, that really is also the early church history. They understood, they trusted, they believed in this helper. They submitted their will to God. They waited for the helper to come. And then the early church spawned, and that's the rest of Acts. And it's the church going through trials and going through troubles and coming out on the other side better and stronger every time. And that, that church history continues for quite some time after Acts, for the beginning, where they continued to face persecution, they continued to face troubles. God continued to provide for them. The church continued to grow. The message continued to spread. And 2,000 some odd years later, our message is still alive and still well and still the same and still spreading. It's a success story. And it's good. And it's something to take heart in as, as, an, as an action of faith. All right. So for the discipline of listening, one of the first things that uh, I would recommend is that, as Paul says, we're supposed to pray without ceasing. We should be in a habit of consulting God on a regular basis. All right? God should be a daily, a daily part of life. Um, also, you should be aware of as much general revelation as physically possible for you to understand. God has given that to us as a starting point. All right? And specific revelation, the things that he tells you to do in a moment, will never contradict what's in is, is general revelation, the things that are always, always true, okay? And so if you're unaware of the things that are always, always true, it is possible to be led astray because we're still human and we still make mistakes. Jesus says that the good, the, the sheep will know my voice, right? But that doesn't mean that we can't get distracted. And that doesn't mean that we can't make mistakes and be sure that we're right. The Pharisees were absolutely convinced that with their knowledge of Scripture, with their knowledge of the Bible, with their knowledge of God, that Jesus was not the Messiah, okay? And the Sadducees were the same. They were, they were convinced that this was not what God had planned. They knew what God had planned. It was not this. They were wrong. They were absolutely wrong. And one of the most poignant points in Scripture to me is John 9, where Jesus heals the blind man, and then the Pharisees come and question him about who Jesus is. And the blind man asks him, shouldn't you really know that? Honestly, like, you're the religious elites, you study scripture, shouldn't you be aware of who this guy is and who he claims to be? You know, this guy was healed from physical blindness. They should have been able to take off and get healing for their spiritual blindness. They could not do it, not in that moment. Okay? They were convinced that they were right. 
we can still be wrong. It, it is sad when that happens, you know, but being human, I, I, I do believe that there is grace and that Jesus' whole working in the Gospels with the Pharisees was to first convince them that they were wrong so that they could then have salvation in him. Because until they were convinced that they weren't on the right path to God, they couldn't even fathom that they needed to find God. They were thought they were safe. Why go seek spiritual enlightenment from God if you're if you're on the right path, right? So another part, just a just a subtle, you know, be prepared to be wrong. Is okay if you're wrong, as long as you're willing to admit that God knows better than you. He will find a way to bring you back on the path that brings you to what is right and what is good, and to live a life that's worthy of Him. All right. And the last part, when we're talking about our our discipline of listening. Make sure when you're taking stock right, that you that you see God to ask, all right, God, you know, what is my internal being? Am I am I internally at peace? Do I need some more from you? You know, are there, there there are things that we always need to work on for all time, and we also have to make sure we're taking stock of what we're what we're producing, what fruit is in our life, right? Because if you if you feel again, if you feel that you're at peace, but there isn't any peace reflected in the life that you're living, then, then you're not really. There's, there's something there that you need to take to God to ensure that that is something that's actually being produced, right? And that goes further on with just those kind of internal ones, but it also is about our, our actions as members of the church, Big C, not like uh, Baroque, but also I guess Baroque because we're part of the Big C, um, is that, that the church is called to do works, right? We should be doing the things, the, the scripture that I had Pastor Debbie read at the beginning was about how um, in, in the Old Testament they were doing some of the things that God had commanded them to do, but they weren't actually doing the things, they weren't fulfilling the purpose of the things. They were going through the motions. God was saying, if you would do the things I've called you to do with their intended purpose, which is to reach the lost, then you will see what I have for you. Then you will be blessed. Then you will come into the fulmination, the culmination of what it is that I have for you to be. But if you continue to do what you're doing with none of the actual fulfillment, uh, then it's not going to happen. All right, the reason that I want you to fast is so that you can reach out to the lost and give your food to, to those. The reason I want you to, to share your food with them is because they need to know that I provide for them, and the method of my provision is going to be you in this moment, if you will follow what I've commanded you to do. Right, And that is still the purpose of the church. We should be doing works in our lives personally and as a corporate body. as both a singular mandate and, and a corporate mandate. Right? It's not, the scripture would indicate that it's not enough to just allow the church, big C, to do the work of God. That you are supposed to actively participate in personal life on a day-to-day -day basis and on Sunday. And, and on Wednesday, and on Thursday, and on Tuesday, whichever days it is you end up at the church. Many of us are here often. Um, and, and that what we need to do is take stock every day and say, God, do you have a work for me to do today? Do you have a thing for me to do today? Is there someone that I can provide for today? Is there someone out there that needs you today? I know that I did good work yesterday. Yay, good for me. But today's a new day. And there are people that need you today, just like there are people that need you yesterday. What can I do today? And that's hard. I'll be honest with you. I have bad days. I have days where I'm tired and where I'm exhausted and where the last thing on my mind is other people because I'm a selfish human being and I think of myself first. Um, and it's not all bad. You are, I am important individually, right? But part of Christianity is understanding that we are supposed to, as Jesus did when he was on earth, let go of ourselves and think and work for others and think and try our best to make an impact in the lives of those that need God more than we need, you know, a break in that moment. Um, and again, I'm only really talking about the spiritual discipline of guidance. There is a lot of spiritual disciplines, as I'm sure you've heard in our, our particular sermon. Um, and and I, the longer that I'm alive, which is not very long, honestly, but you know, um, the more I'm convinced that life is about balance. 
So I, I am really taking a hard focus on what it means to live a life that is being guided by the Holy Spirit. But part of that is also that when you take stock of how life is going, understand that, that there is a lot to being Christian and there's a lot to being guided by God. These are the important, poignant points that I have I felt the need to share today. Um, there is more, and he will reveal more to you. And I, I part of part of this is, is just a recommendation that again we, we actively participate in the disciplines and the disciplines of what it means to be Christian and the discipline of what it means to listen on a daily basis and to consult with God about the state of our inner beings and where we are inside because we're not really good at taking stock of that. That's why Jesus had to send the Holy Spirit in the first place. And just take stock of what our lives are producing. Um, because again, a lot of times we're not really all that great at taking stock of what it is that we're actually producing um, in life. I think Dylan went to go get our our peoples because I'm wrapping up here. Um, and we're going to take uh, maybe, oh, I don't know. I was going to take a moment here uh, when our worship team comes um, that w for, for what they have planned to take stock. All right, God is, God is here and he is present and that now is the time to, to seek him to take stock of where your life is at, to take stock of if there's things inside that need changed. Again, it's never, it's never too late or too early to start the change. Of, of things externally in your own life that you need to work on expressing for, for the existence of Christ, for works that can be done to further the kingdom of God, to show who God is in the lives of people. You know, maybe there's an individual that you can love on individually or personally. Maybe there is a group that you should join or, or participate with. Um, I, I would encourage you to seek God and listen, to prayerfully look for him, and if you feel the need to pray for someone, please do. That, that sometimes part of seeking guidance from God is that other people need some intercession and he's ready and available and you can stand in for them. So I, I would encourage you to, to, to take this time and take stock of, God, of what it is that God has for you. higher than that is higher than 
continue to be in a heart of worship and a heart of listening. So Holy Spirit, just continue to speak. I am blessed and thankful. May we go out and hear the Lord. What is the benediction today? Ah, yes. May we go listening to the Holy Spirit closely and follow his leading. Go in peace. Yes, what? Oh, oh, we need to pray for the offering. We do need to pray for the offering. We lift up this offering to you lord jesus we are thankful for the many people that have been faithful in giving lord god we ask that you would meet the needs of this church that you would meet the needs of the ministry that you've called us to do here at burr oak i thank you for this church and i thank you for the people that gather here and for the work you're doing in our lives and lord god i ask that you would bless us financially and that we can bless others financially I ask this in Jesus' name, amen.